So have you ever had ingredients that didn't seem to go together, but when you put them together, they tasted good? I used to live with a wonderful family named the McCaffron family. And when we would come home from Sunday church, they would make all kinds of sandwiches. And one of them was a tomato mayonnaise and peanut butter sandwich. That just looked too weird for me. And it was a long time before I would try it. Those things did not seem to go together at all. But when I tasted them, it somehow worked. So inspired by that, I put on Facebook a question. Have you ever had ingredients that didn't seem to go together? That did. And I got some amazingly surprising responses. One of my favorite came from a high school friend who said that apparently whipped cream on fish or french fries sprinkled with Old Bay seasoning is tasty, or so my kids tell me. I'm not sure I'm up to that one. Another one was a, an M&M sandwich. When I asked, well, how did you keep the M&M? She said she just crushed them. Another one was bay scallops sauteed in butter with confectionery sugar. And he said, don't ask. The Paris family gave me some surprising ones. Carrie Lynn said that her husband's children, not her children, but her husband's children like pickle and jelly sandwiches. And Alan likes pickles and popcorn. So I think I'm gonna to have to try that today. Kathy Clopper likes jumbo bologna and peanut butter sandwich dipped in hot tea and creamed lettuce with hard-boiled eggs over stuffing and mashed potatoes. Another friend like peas, baked potatoes, and tuna fish sandwiches. I'm not sure if you mix those together. Best Alter Stahl likes lemon and bologna rolled up with peanut butter, so we'll have to try that one today. Sandy Mills likes peanut butter, mayo, Tabasco sauce, onion, lettuce on toasted bread. I'll trust her on that one. Dave Decker likes American cheese, mayo, and relish sandwich. And Caleb, our dear worship leader, thinks that mustard on pizza is very underrated. So I have a question for you this morning. Um, I'll read you one, a couple more. Judy Pace likes peanut butter, bacon, cheese, tomato, lettuce, and mayonnaise on wheat. Valerie Wallace sardines and steamed green plantain and my favorite toby hampshire potato roll french dressing american cheese and wait for it reese's peanut butter cup <laughs> so i'm going to get the ingredients together and, and i am going to try to mix some of these that i'm not used to together and we'll see how it goes but in the meantime you can talk in your family or in, in your household or in your journal are there any ingredients that you've mixed together in the kitchen that you didn't think would work and did? And in scripture, are there any things, ingredients that seem not to go together? Today we're going to be talking about two ingredients that are hard for us to bring together as human beings. The love of God and the suffering of people. So you can pause the tape and talk in your household while I get our ingredients ready. So the first one ingredients that don't go together is my friend Larry Leland and Beth Jones, both who were district superintendents, suggested strawberry jelly with a grilled cheese sandwich. Not so sure. Not bad. It might grow on me. The Paris family um, so I suggested pickles and popcorn. So I didn't think that was in a sandwich. So I'll just try this together. Now that is a, is a, a deal. That's a good one. Best stall and countless others in various forms. So I don't think Beth put this as a sandwich. She said it was peanut butter with Lebanon bologna rolled up. C 
so let's go. That works. I'm not sure if I'll keep doing it, but it works. So all of this is to say that sometimes there's ingredients that we don't think go together in the kitchen. And when we come to scripture, um, the scripture that was read this morning from John 11, talks about some ingredients as human beings we don't think belong together. And so we're gonna talk about those now. Okay, so now that I got the peanut butter out of my tea, let's talk about some ingredients that we don't think go together in the Bible story. We hear them right, the first one right away. It's one that we're familiar with during this pandemic. Right away in the gospel lesson, we hear the story framed that Lazarus is sick. And so the first ingredient that we hear in the story is suffering. Suffering is difficult for all of us. We hear the reports and some of us are experiencing real suffering in this pandemic. People have lost jobs. Oh, I have three friends now that have COVID-19 um, and all sorts of other suffering. People have lost loved ones. I read of a family where an adult daughter lost both of her parents within three days of each other with the coronavirus. Add to that all the suffering in the world throughout our time together in Haiti and in places where people are refugees. Difficult circumstances. And so the second ingredient that John introduces in the story, Lazarus is sick, but the sisters, Mary and Martha, send a message to Jesus saying this, Lord, the one who you love is sick. We know from John's account in verse 5, Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. John states this. The story at that point is framed with this word, the second ingredient, love. Yes, Lazarus is sick, and yes, Mary and Martha are worried, and eventually they will grieve his loss, but the story that John tells is framed in this ingredient called love. And that's where we have the problem, isn't it? That on our in our ingredients, suffering and love don't go together in our minds. How many times have you talked to someone who is is not a believer who says, I can't believe that a good God would allow people to suffer. Or perhaps our own experience, we suffer, we experience a loss or a death, we pray a prayer and we don't get the answer that we think we want. And we struggle and say, where was God when this was going on? Did I do something wrong? Is God punishing me? Or how can a good God, who, if God really loves me, how could he let that happen? So we have suffering and love pushed together in this passage. And usually our way to resolve it is to deny the suffering, well, it will be all be okay in heaven, and toss suffering out of the sandwich. Or we toss the love and give up. But Jesus invites a third ingredient into our mixture here. And as we go on, as he talks to the disciples about the message that Lazarus is sick, Jesus says something really surprising, and it's the third ingredient that holds everything else together. And he says to the disciples, for your sakes, I'm glad this has happened, so that you can know the glory of God. And that's the third part of the sandwich, knowing God. It's not that Lazarus being sick and falling into death is a good thing. God is not the one who sends death. 
God did not create death. Death came because we disobeyed God. We're the one who invited death into the world. Not just our particular sin, but we live in a fallen world where sin brings death and sickness into our world. Not one particular person bringing it, but we live in a fallen world where suffering exists. And Jesus doesn't say it's good that Lazarus suffers. We'll find out later in the story that's not at all the case. God is not indifferent to our suffering. Jesus himself suffers. But Jesus introduces the glory of God. So what is the glory of God? Well, it's knowing God. Having God's glory present is God revealing himself to us, showing us who he really is, his real nature, his real character. Jesus says to the disciples, that, that knowing that glory, having God's glory revealed, will in fact be the, the message that frames the story. So as we talk about those three ingredients, love of God, suffering, and the glory of God. And you can pause the tape and talk about these questions. Where has your story been framed by the love of God? And how do you see it framing the disciples' story so far? You can pause the tape. So Jesus gets the news that Mary, from Mary and Martha that Lazarus, whom he loves, is sick. And John tells us that Jesus delays two more days because the sickness is for God's glory. So when Jesus arrives, Lazarus indeed has already died. And Martha, upon hearing that Jesus is coming, now after Lazarus has been in the tomb for days, she runs to Jesus to greet him. But in her question and greeting to him, is the struggle with how Jesus could love them and not show up to save Lazarus. Think of Mary and Martha. They know that Jesus loves them. They have seen Jesus heal countless people in the miracles. They know about his miracles of healing. And yet, when they, his friends, call to him, somehow he does not rescue them and their precious brother has died. So when Martha sees Jesus, she greets him, but she also has a question for him. The statement, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's a statement, but it's a question. It's a question we ask. God, why didn't you come? Why didn't you come and rescue us? Why didn't you come and save Lazarus? I prayed for the job and I didn't get it. I prayed for my loved one and they died. Lord, if you had been here, the story would be different. Why did you let us suffer in this way? It's a difficult question for us because we think love and suffering are not compatible. And Jesus tests Martha. They engage in a conversation in which Jesus asks her, but does she believe in the resurrection? And she responds, I, I believe at the end of the age. And Jesus then responds to her and says this, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even when they die, yet shall they live. See, our problem is when we struggle, we think that God can't love us and let our prayers go unanswered. And Mary then picks up the same strain with Jesus, but here's a couple things to remember in this story. 
One is Jesus in response does something amazing. After he's greeted Martha and Mary, he asks to go to the tomb where Lazarus is. They are asking the question, why didn't you come? His response is believe. He doesn't answer their questions, and he doesn't answer ours. Even if he did, would we really understand God's ways? But what he does is he goes to the point, the very place of their suffering, the grave of their brother. And in 11, verse 35, he does this. Jesus weeps. He doesn't offer them explanations about why he hasn't come, although he has a very good purpose in mind, yet to be disclosed. He doesn't give them long treatises of theology like we pastors sometimes do. He doesn't give a glib response. He simply comes to the very heart of our suffering, and Jesus weeps. This morning, as God looks at our suffering, it is not with indifference. It is not with a glib answer. It's not even with the assurance we sometimes give, oh, but in heaven it will be okay. That's not God's response. His response, on one level, was for Jesus to weep with us. On another level, this story happens as Jesus is headed to the cross, willing to bear on his own body every bit of suffering the world will ever have every bit of sin that caused our deaths. But in the midst of all of it, before he goes to the cross, Jesus stands at that tomb, and with Mary and Martha, and with us, Jesus weeps. So this morning I have another set of questions for you. What does it mean to you to have a God who weeps with us? And over whom is Jesus weeping this morning? Pause the tape and take some time to pray for them now. So I hope this morning that the fact that we have a God who weeps with us is of comfort to you in whatever you're facing. A few weeks ago, we talked about Jesus being in the boat with us. But now we have the picture of a God who weeps with us. And I hope that brings you comfort. Scripture also says he knows every tear and remembers every tear that we cry. He's not indifferent to our suffering. When we experience a loss or an illness, when we experience job loss, it's not because God is indifferent to us or that he just casually sits by and watches our pain. When my kids were small, um, one of them had, was so brave, whenever he had a shot at the doctor's office, Sam didn't even cry. <laughs> But when he was about two and a half, we had to have him tested for Lyme's disease. And unfortunately, the person at the hospital who was testing him was not very good at finding uh, the veins in a child. And she poked him over and over, and I finally put a stop to it and took him somewhere else. But it so traumatized him that for several years after, if our oldest knew he was getting a shot, even though he was usually didn't cry about anything, he would start to fall apart. So vaccines became very traumatic for Sam and for Mom because as soon as he knew there was a needle, he would just fall apart. And it was so hard as a parent to have to hold him tight against his will as he begged and pleaded with me and cried and to let the nurse or the doctor put the shot in him, even though I knew it caused him pain and fear. It was so difficult to watch. But I also knew that that vaccine was most important. 
that should that illness come around, it would save my child's life. And so I was willing to just hold him tight. And sometimes <laughs> even get tears in my own eyes. But hold out so that he could get the medicine he needed to be safe. God is not indifferent to our suffering. But before Jesus enters the scene with Mary and Martha, remember he says to the disciples that he is, he is glad, not for the illness, but so that they are here to witness the glory of God. Jesus delays his coming not to hurt Mary and Martha, not because he doesn't love Lazarus, but because he knows something more important is at stake. And it's that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, but also the disciples, will learn and experience the glory of God, the power of God, for themselves. The disciples were headed to Jerusalem. They didn't understand. But Jesus himself, and not very long after this story, was going to the cross. And the disciples, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, would be left with the horrific suffering of Jesus on the cross and on his death. And in that holy weekend between Good Friday and Resurrection Easter, they would be asked to believe, to trust in God even in the worst of their circumstances, to believe that God's glory, his very nature, was one that is absolutely faithful, absolutely trustworthy, and that so no matter what they were experiencing with their eyes and with their heart, God is always faithful. He is the light in our darkness. He can be trusted even when we're fearful and afraid. And so God, Jesus goes to that tomb that day. It's important that he weeps with us. But it's also important what happened next. He asked for the stone to be moved and the grave to be opened. And he doesn't do a generic miracle. He calls Lazarus to come forth. He calls him by name. And Lazarus rises from the dead. Immediately, Jesus asks for the grave cloth to be removed. Lazarus is returned to his sisters. We have a God who is in control. Jesus was scripting this. He did not send the illness. But even in the worst of circumstances in that household's journey, Jesus was still at work. Even when they couldn't see him. Even when he didn't seem to come. Jesus was at work. And he offered them the opportunity to trust and to believe where they've not yet seen. In doing so, he gave the disciples, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, that which they would need going forward. To know that Jesus Christ is more powerful than death. To know that he has the power to redeem any hopeless situation. To know that the story is never over until Jesus has his final amen. He did it in love to prepare the disciples so they would learn to trust in him completely for the rest of their journeys. Jesus' glory is the third ingredient. His character, his nature, his power. 
to raise the dead. And this morning, Jesus invites us into the scene called Corona. Somewhere I know Jesus is weeping. There's not a person who is suffering that Jesus does not have tears on his face. I know he is working behind the scenes in ways we cannot understand. He certainly is pouring out his spirit on his church to witness into new ways and opening up the ears of people who might not have been paying attention to the gospel and to Christ. I can't explain what God is doing in the pandemic. I can only say I know who Jesus Christ is. It's not the circumstances that give me hope. It's who he is that gives me hope. It is impossible for God to break any promise he has ever made to us. It's impossible. His nature and his character simply cannot break a promise to us. It is impossible for God not to be working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It's impossible. That's who he is. In this Jesus who wept tears at the grave then demonstrated his power to raise Lazarus, to resurrect to put a different ending to the story and one by which the greatest good that more people could get to know who he is I can't explain God's purposes I'm not that smart but if he trusted Mary, Martha and Lazarus and the disciples that day so that more people could know who he is Perhaps that might be the smallest thread of a purpose because more people are getting to know Jesus Christ. So let us pray in that direction. But also, Jesus removes the great cloth, everything that was holding Lazarus back. Perhaps that's his purpose for his church, to remove some of the things that we've been clinging to that are holding us back from that very central mission of our lives to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and to share him with others. I see so many of us moving in new directions, working hard to learn new ways of sharing the gospel. Now that our schedule is clear, we're taking the time to reach out to neighbors and friends and to offer them words of hope. I want to give you this other comfort today. Jesus was able to move those things that were binding Lazarus. So what grave cloths do you need Jesus to remove today? And what in today's story helps you trust Jesus even when you can't see him working? You can pause the tape. So it's my prayer this morning that God's word has brought comfort to you. We can hope in a lot of things. We can hope in a certain answer to a prayer. But if God chooses to work in a different direction, we may be discouraged. Sometimes we put our hope in a particular ending or a particular outcome. But we're not in control of our circumstances. But the more that we learn the nature of God, the more we come to know who Jesus Christ is, his goodness, his faithfulness, his mercy, his strength, his integrity, his purity, the more that we get to know him, the more we can put our hope in the one where it will never be broken. That we put our hope in Christ rather than an outcome of the story. How do we do that? 
we keep reading the Gospels and every day ask God to show us who he is. We invite Jesus Christ to be in our life. And you can do that with a prayer. I will pray in a, a minute. We spend time with God every day. And my friends, I have to say, the other way we get to know him is by allowing him to, get, to guide us through a storm and the difficult circumstances of our life. I trust in God completely because I found him to be trustworthy to a lot of difficult seasons in my journey. So don't be afraid to cling to him. Hope in him and you will not ever be disappointed. You might be disappointed that things didn't go the way you want. But Christ will never fail you. Let us pray. Lord, we do pray for the suffering. We thank you that you are a God who doesn't minimalize our suffering. You didn't just say, Mary and Martha, just if you had faith, you wouldn't be so worried. You saw the depth of their despair. And you went to the grave and you wept. But God, you are a God who is always working your good in our lives even sometimes in the painful chapters. How it must pain you to watch us cry and the world cry out to you today. But we trust that you are always a good God and that your purposes are working for your glory in ways that will reveal you to more people so that more people might know your son, Jesus Christ. In those days when you seem distant, help us to remember that that day in which your precious son died on the cross, you did not move in to save. You watched him suffer, allowing him because you knew a greater good was coming. The defeat of sin and death, the resurrection in which we hope now. And so God, help us to, to learn more about you and to know you. Reveal yourself to us in new ways in this pandemic so we might trust in you more completely and more fully. And when we hit our Lazarus moments, may we know you well enough to know you would never leave us or forsake us. Our God shall surely come to us and that you are the God of all glory and all power all mercy and strength. And especially for those today who need to start a new relationship with you. Lord, we pray in this moment, as I pray, they would echo my prayers in their hearts, maybe even using words of their own. Dear Jesus, I want to know you. I've heard your gospel stories and they intrigue me. They put a longing in me to know you better. So, Lord, I am open to you. Show yourself to me. Help me to learn you, who you are. I have unbelief, but help my unbelief so that I might trust in you. And, Lord, I ask for you to come into my life, to come and forgive my sin because of your work on the cross and to live in me. I can't find you, God, so find me and show me who you are. And if you will come, I will serve you all the days of my life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you would like to know more about Jesus Christ, uh, you can contact us through the website, www.firstonsecond. Um, in the communication section. You can call us at the church office and leave a message. We are in the building um, at different times during the week, but we are here. And we are here because we want to help you to know Jesus, the one who never fails. You can also email me at pastor4fmc at gmail.com. But reach out to us so we can help you on your journey. God bless you.
comment.